Welcome to this year's Power Barometer, the highly anticipated annual update and analysis of the European power sector. My name is Bruce Douglas, the Director of Business and Communications at Euroelectric. We are delighted to have over 1,000 participants registered to this event, and we aim to deliver a lively, innovative and content-rich experience for you all. Please feel free to post on social media about the findings using the hashtags PowerBarometer21, It's Electric and Electric Decade. We have a great lineup of speakers for you today, starting with Jean-Bernard Lévy, the President of Euroelectric and CEO of the EDF Group. Unfortunately, Mr. Lévy was not able to join us physically in our studio today, but we are delighted to have an exclusive recording of him in conversation with journalist Katarina Sitchell. Please enjoy his insights and vision. I'm Katrina Sickle. I'm a moderator and broadcaster, and I'm here this morning in Paris with Monsieur Jean-Bernard Lévy. He is CEO of EDF Group for almost seven years and more recently president of Euroelectric since May. So good morning, an absolute pleasure to be with you. Nice good morning, to be with you Mr. Too. Levy. Now, I've done my homework, obviously, and I see that the focus of your two-year mandate is broadly to really push that transformation away from fossil fuels and make the European Green Deal a reality through electrification. So I'm going to start with a quote, a framing quote, if I may from the previous president. He said when he handed over that you're in the change, we're in the change now, not approaching it, and this is the decade of doing. Is that something you would agree with? Well, I would certainly agree with that, and if it was not the case, I think we would be missing great opportunities because we are already six years from yep. the Paris agreements, aren't yep. we? Yeah, yeah. And so uh, all the European countries, they um, made commitments, and now we have to deliver. So we are right in the middle of it. So let's talk about that delivery and something very important, as we know on the table today, the Fit for 55 package published by the European Commission mm -hmm. in July. You've got these 13 proposals adopted and, and really to ensure that these EU policies are fit for, re for reducing net mm -hmm. greenhouse gas emissions by 55% by 2030. So that's a revision from 40%. I think the obvious question is, is the European power sector really fit and ready for this ambitious challenge? I think there is, there is no doubt that the power sector is, is ready and is ready to accelerate. Uh, we can be fully decarbonized uh, in electricity earlier than what we expected. So that means we can follow the trend of the Fit for 55 package, which is, of course, better than Fit for 40. It's Fit for 55, not Fit for 40. Yeah. We can electrify more, more quickly and we have uh, what it takes to do it. We have the technologies with renewables and, uh, and nuclear. We have uh, the need for uh, a robust uh, contribution of coal closures, yeah. which hasn't so much been the case recently in some countries, as we know, but it has been in other countries. So some countries are leading the way in mm -hmm. terms of coal closures, mm -hmm. and we expect it to accelerate in the current decade not the next decade, mm -hmm. the current decade. And then we need a lot of investment in generation. Everybody thinks generation. Yes, mm -hmm. of course, mm -hmm. generation. But also in networks, whether it is transmission or distribution. And we see that despite the pandemic, cost of capital, cost of borrowing has remained very low. Mm -hmm. So we'll have all it takes for these huge capex. OK, so you're obviously you're, you're very ambitious and you've said, yes, but we need these things. You've been very, very clear in order to to really meet the challenges. Um, you've got the climate change challenge that's intensifying, but obviously you've also got the pandemic and you've got you've got. The, so can I just ask, you know, what what's your response to that? Do you see a, a, a trade off? I think uh, first the power sector in Europe uh, has to be very proud of its performance during the pandemic because we delivered the power that was needed. Maybe there was a bit less power needed, a bit less demand, obviously, because of the uh, economic slowdown, but we delivered what was needed and we, we performed very well. And now we are recovering in terms of the economy, but the power sector is itself booming because electricity needs will grow very significantly because we need this migration from the past, which is gas, which is uh, fuel-based, which is coal-based, uh, power generation, and we need to migrate that towards uh, low carbon uh, or carbon-free 
generation tools. We need also to accelerate investment in distribution networks and in transmission networks. And I would say the power sector itself is fit for 2030. So let's let's stay. I mean, there's a lot of stuff there that you've just said, and I'd like to just have a little recap your your thoughts on where we are at with the the climate, you know, the climate channel challenge globally. So let me have a think. Your thoughts on that, but also obviously importantly in the lead up to COP26 in Glasgow. So if you had to say, right, Katrina, my three main expectations for that COP would be so. Where is that challenge globally and what are your expectations for COP26? I think at Euroelectric, we are happy with the commitments that have been made by Europe that will be, of course, challenged by uh, Parliament and then we will yeah. have all the implementation of 50, 455, but I think 50, 455 is the European response to uh, what, uh, what needs to be done at COP26 and others and maybe other continents are expected to deliver at COP26 where we shouldn't be so much surprised but what Europe be, will be delivering because mm -hmm. uh, mid-July we had the 455 package mm -hmm. from Europe. So I think as uh, uh, president of Euroelectric I would like to say that our companies, whether they generate or they distribute the electrons, we are ready to accelerate. Mm -hmm. And so let's do it. Let's do it. And we can reach uh, goals in 2030 or 2035, which are way ahead of what had been planned at the times of the 2015 Paris agreements, because the technology is there and because also the financing is there. And we have the resources, the competence and uh, the will to do it. Now, you sound very positive. I'm going to throw not a spanner in the works, but I'm going to play, what do you call it, devil's advocate. And I'm going to Please. say, you know, all of us, all, all relevant stakeholders, but the average consumer, the mm -hmm. average citizen, we see that there's some, there's some tricky stuff out there. I mean, mm -hmm. difficult. We've got, you know, on the one hand, you've got floods, you've got wildfires. Mm -hmm. And on the other hand, even recently, we've got cyber attacks. So you talked very, very positively about the sector and its readiness. So I suppose mm -hmm. the word I'd use now is to say, do you think the sector is resilient? enough to meet those challenges. I think it has shown it is brilliant. I, I was discussing with the head of the distribution operator in Greece, which was probably the country that was uh, in proportion the most hurt yeah. by these climate events in the summer that everybody saw. At the same time, you had the IPCC report. Yeah. You, have, you had the wildfires in, in, on several continents. You had the floods in, uh, um, in Germany, in Belgium, and of course, uh, Greece and other Mediterranean countries also had wildfires, like in Siberia and California and so on. Uh, I was discussing with him. He, he was very proud of his ability. In uh, just a couple of days, the network was, was right. back in operations for every Greek citizen, or maybe 99% of the people uh -huh. that had been hurt by the wildfires. So in the power sector, yes, we are resilient. And then we are you know, eager to contribute. We, mm -hmm. we want to show that, yes, electricity is a key solution to, to climate uh, uh, issues, to global warming. Mm -hmm. So let's do it. I like that, because you've got that marriage there, I think, being very clear between we've got the technology, we've got the resilience, but you also have the eagerness. There's that emotion and there's the tech. You've got the two going hand in hand, I think. And that sounds... is our response. When we, yeah. when we, when we look at... Uh, uh, you know, opinion polls and so on. Young people are expecting the generation who is at the helm of, uh, of the economy and so on to, to, to respond, to give the response. So we need regulation. We need uh, an, uh, uh, probably acceleration, let's say, of cold closures, for instance. We need uh, thinking and action regarding taxation. Yeah. We know that mm -hmm. right now there are still lots of subsidies to fossil fuels and taxation on electricity that has to change, that has to go exactly the other way. Mm -hmm. So let's do it. We, we know what needs to be done. And we have a, a lot of pressure from the young generations who are also our clients. Absolutely. And of course, there you really do put your finger on some of the findings and some of the uh, that you are publishing in this uh, barometer. I think it's the third year edition, it is, is it not? Year. So you're, yeah. you've, you've been very clear there and also in talking to me what, what you think is really critical to make sure that transformation becomes a reality. I've got a last couple of very quick questions while I still have you with me. Just in case you didn't say enough, this Fit for 55 package, is it for you tweaks and upgrades or is it real innovation? And the reason I ask is because of course in the EU we've seen shifts, we've seen revisions to targets before. Anything else that's different for you that you'd like to focus on there? I think uh, public opinion is pressing political, 
and economic decision makers to act. I think mm. that's very new. We see uh, a, a shareholder mm -hmm. now being organized in terms of ESG-based investment yeah. and not so much what is my profit. It's got to be both, of course. We've seen uh, uh, all over Europe and in other countries, we've, we've seen people demonstrating on climate. We've seen, I was very uh, surprised, there was a report in France that uh, when you looked at the various values for which people would be able to demonstrate, the people were saying, well, for climate, yes, yeah. indeed, I mm -hmm. will go on the street and say, we are not doing enough. Mm -hmm. So we have a key role to play, mm -hmm. and we expect we'll be enabled to play that role. So across the board, I think that, that you talk there of eagerness from your point of view, but I think you're saying, I think across the board, societally, there is that eagerness. So in, 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 in the society, and we have to replicate what society uh, is expecting from absolutely. us. Absolutely. Thank you so much. I Thank wish you, you Katrina. much, much luck in your ongoing journey as president. And uh, now back to you in Brussels. Thank you. What great messages from Jean-Bernard Lévy. We can decarbonize faster than expected and the European power sector is ready to deliver on the electric decade. I'm now delighted to introduce the Secretary General of Euroelectric, Christian Ruby, who will present the main findings of this year's Power Barometer. Over to you, Christian. Climate chaos, climate crisis, climate catastrophe, What's the most fitting term for what we're seeing unfold across the world these years? Just think of the summer we have behind us, firestorms in the United States of America, rain on the summit of Greenland, and torrential rains, deadly floods across Central Europe. No matter what we call it, the impacts of a changing climate are with us right here, right now, and they're leaving deep wounds on human societies. The good news, is that policymakers are finally stepping up and doing something about it. In July this year, the European Commission came forward with their proposals for how to slash greenhouse gas emissions by 55% already by 2030. The proposals outline sweeping changes to the European economy, and in order to deliver what's on the table, we are facing a roaring electric decade. Because in essence, the task is about replacing fossil fuels with clean electricity. Needless to say, electricity will need to be cleaned up as well. And with the current political plan, the decarbonization of the power sector is really going warp speed. Up until a few years ago, the plan was to reach full decarbonization of the power sector somewhere between 2045 and 2050. With the current plans, we're advancing that significantly so that the full decarbonization will now be reached somewhere between 2035 and 2040. In other words, we're basically bringing forward the decarbonization of the sector somewhere between five and 10 years. That's going to put electricity way ahead uh, in the race to zero, and that's good for us, that's an opportunity. But let's be clear, it's also a very big challenge. We're gonna need the help of citizens and local communities to get stuff done, get things built, and we're gonna need the support of policymakers to remove any obstacle in the way. But let's start with some good news. Electricity is already well on the way to decarbonize. 2020 was a historical year where renewables overtook fossil fuels for the first time in history. Weather conditions and lower demand due to the COVID crisis each played their part in creating this watershed moment. But it is really the persistent efforts of the sector to phase out the most polluting plants and replace it by renewables that made this possible in the first place. Taking a look at the share of coal, it was declining faster than expected, and no less than 21 member states have announced a full phase-out by 2030. Combined, renewables and nuclear covered 65% of power demand in 2020. In other words, almost two-thirds of electricity was already carbon neutral last year. That's a lot, much more than any other energy carrier, but in order to go to 2030, we need to go even further. 
Now, going from 65 to more than 80 may not look like much on a pie chart, but let me tell you, it is quite a big deal. First of all, we need to remember that the overall production of electricity needs to increase since we're powering bigger shares of the economy. By 2030, we need to increase the overall production by more than a quarter compared to today. And since we're phasing out fossil fuels, we need to increase the share of renewables by almost 100%. And mind you, that's 100% compared to today, where a big part of renewables is hydro and biomass, both of which are challenging to build out. That means that solar needs to double, and the same goes for wind. In order to ensure security of supply, we need a fleet of dispatchable plants. Of course, they will need to be low or zero carbon as well, but we also need a massive build out of storage. Look at the amount of batteries we'll need by 2030. And this little part on top, that's pumped hydro. Now, that can look small on these bar charts, but the truth is we're talking about a build out of somewhere between 50 and 60 major artificial lakes in order to deliver this in just nine and a half years. In order for this build out to happen, we need to see massive investments flow. Just for the generation part, we're looking at an estimate of 75 billion euros per year, every year until 2030. Add on top of that the storage I was mentioning, and then we come to the grids, because we also need modernized reinforced grids to connect all this new capacity. Your electric estimates that we need some 400 billion euros of investments just for the distribution grids. And in order for all this investments to flow, it's absolutely critical that it is attractive for the investors to invest in the sector. Because this world is not short of money. There's plenty of investors out there looking for bankable projects. It's all about whether the business case is there, whether there's a return on their investments. And in order for investors to look to our sector, we need to be sure, first of all, that governments don't intervene randomly in the market and make changes all of a sudden. Secondly, we need long-term investment signals. These assets stand on the ground anywhere between 20 and 40, perhaps even 50 years, and the investors need to know that they actually get a return all the way through. And the lack of investment signals, long-term investment signals, is actually part of the reason why storage is not ticking off at the speed and the scale we need today. Another critical issue is permitting. So the procedures by which you actually obtain a permission to build a new wind turbine, a solar farm, or a grid line. And this may very well become the single biggest obstacle to actually achieving the 2030 targets. It's very simple. Ambition requires permission. If I have the ambition to run a marathon, that's great. If I don't get the permission to actually run, I'm not going anywhere. This is all the time we have between 2020 and 2030. We're already here, coming towards the end of 2021. Now the standard project takes somewhere between four and six years to actually get the permit, and sometimes even longer. It's very clear that the industry will be left with very little time to build all this new capacity unless we do something about this. That's gonna create frustration, and ultimately there's a risk of missing the target. And we need to deliver on the targets because we need the additional electricity to replace fossil fuels in transport, in buildings, and in industry. According to our estimates, electricity would need to cover at least a third of total final energy consumption by 2030. Today, it's only 23%, so the increase is very steep. Have a look at this. This is where the electrification would go without any further measures. With the proposal from the European Commission, it would increase to this level, but in actual fact, would need to go up here in order to stay on the curve. Regardless, we're looking at some very big changes in a very small time frame. Take the example of e-mobility. Last year, one out of 10 cars had a plug. This year, it's already two out of 10 cars who have a plug. The plan is to phase out the sales of combustion engines already in 14 years from now. 
In order for this to become a seamless and smooth experience for the customers so they don't miss the old, is that we have the necessary charging infrastructure for people to charge when they want, where they want. And with 40 million cars on the road, it goes without saying that we need much more charging. 10 years ago, we had 2,000 charging points in Europe. Today, we have 200,000. By 2030, we need three and a half million. We have a similar development for heat pumps. Today, we have some 15 million heat pumps in Europe. That figure needs to triple in order for us to get to the 2030 objectives. Doubling, tripling, quadrupling, millions, billions, gazillions. I know this can sound a bit overwhelming. And let's be clear, this is not a walk in the park. This is a major industrial transformation. So let us not be intimidated, but let us also not underestimate it. It's not about the numbers. It's not about the millions or the billions. Just think about this. Last year, Apple sold 200 million smartphones, 200 million. So the mass production is not the problem. What this is really about is mustering the necessary determination to come together and deliver on what we've already agreed in terms of targets. It's about removing the obstacles that stand in the way. It's about making it attractive to customers. And it's about getting the rules right once and for all so industry can get going. If we do that, I'm confident we can deliver. So I say, let's do this. Let us make the 2020s the electric decade. Wow, what a dynamic, fascinating and fact-filled analysis showing that faster decarbonization and deeper electrification rates are now politically desirable, technologically possible and economically beneficial. Christian now joins me in the studio. Welcome, Christian. And uh, you'll be joined now by our panel of experts. So first of all, we have Lukas Kalinski, who's the head of unit for renewable energy and system integration policy at DG Energy and the European Commission, joining us from Brussels. Welcome, Lukas. Next, Morning. Morten helveig Peterson, MEP and vice chair of the ITRI committee, uh, joining us from Copenhagen. Welcome, Morten. Thank you. And finally, Morning. Villa Romali. Uh, who's Director for Growth and Development at Vortzilla, joining us from Finland. Welcome, Villa. Thanks a lot. So we're going to do a quick round of questions on what you've just seen. So first to you, Lucas, what do you think of what you've just seen? And also a comment about faster decarbonization and higher levels of electrification. Yes, thank you, Bruce. Uh, thank you. I think the slides mm -hmm. illustrate very well the opportunities and challenges uh, from the power system transition ahead. The fact is that the EU set into law the objective to reach climate neutrality by 2050 and the 2030 uh, cut of greenhouse gas emissions by 55%. And now we face a question how to deliver this cut. And we know it will not happen by itself. And when you think about it, energy represents 75% of the emissions in the EU. We need to overhaul the energy system, which today is dominated by fossil fuels. And this is why renewable energy and energy efficiency play a very central role in the legislative package, delivering the Green Deal, which the Commission adopted in July. To meet our climate target in a cost-efficient manner, we need to double the renewable share in the EU to 40% by 2030. Together, we must push renewables, not only in the power sector, but across all end use sectors, buildings, transport, and industry. And we need to use energy more efficiently to mitigate the necessary capacity increases. And this is, of course, very ambitious, and the challenges are plenty, and Christian's presentation illustrated them well from increased investments in generation and grid, integration of increased volumes of renewables, in a flexible, in an affordable and secure manner, the need to align tax incentives or, or development of storage. There are also challenges on the demand side, let's not forget about them. And the, the fact is that electricity-based options typically have higher upper upfront costs and low operating costs. Think electric vehicles, heat pumps, and that makes it difficult for consumers to compare the costs 
the total cost of ownership, and we need to change this. This will remain in the focus of our action, but we think that this will bring multiple benefits and is doable. Many member states already have a high ambition on renewables, on energy efficiency, that will be backed by significant EU funding. We are seeing progress on the ground. Renewable power not only overtook the fossil fuels in the EU, but in many places, it is now the cheapest source of power. An integrated energy system is the most cost-effective vehicle to achieve decarbonization. Electrification is often the best route, and therefore, we will push electrification across and use sectors that will bring to life new business models, smart charging, flexibility services to electric vehicles or, or buildings. And for hard to decarbonize sectors and applications, we need to promote innovative renewable fuels, advanced biofuels, hydrogen. And this is why our energy legislation and the July legislative package delivering on the Green Deal are about. Thank you. Thank you, Lucas. Uh, excellent. And as you know, we fully support the 5055 package and the ambition of the Commission. So now over to the Parliament, to you, Morton. What's your take on it? And what's the Parliament's view of the, of the next steps? So, uh, first of all, congrats with this uh, power uh, barometer and, 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 and this important uh, contribution. I, I think those kind of, of studies or, or reflections are, are vital for all of us in order to enlighten us and, and further emphasize uh, uh, how important this is and, and how difficult it is. And I think a, a very general conclusion uh, from, from what we've seen is, is basically we're moving too slow. I mean, the, the, uh, the, the study and the numbers that you're providing basically tells us that we need to speed up, uh, that we need to ensure that we get the Fit for 55 package through Parliament, which is uh, going to be extremely difficult because this is now, it's starting to get difficult because now you see all the diverging uh, interests and conflicts and various national interests, uh, conflicting political interests, what have you. Uh, so uh, all this to say that I think it's extremely important that you emphasize that we need speed uh, and, and we need to pass things through uh, that are on the table now. And this is much easier said uh, than done, not least given what's happened lately with, with the search in, in energy prices and, and the sensitivities inherent in this. So uh, I, I think it's, it's a great study. I, I think it also points and leads the way in, in, in so many ways. Uh, I, I think that the, the issue of seeing that the share of renewables in the generation mix has surpassed that of fossil fuels. I mean, it's extremely important, coming back to the point that, that Lucas was, was making just previously, that uh, investing and ramping up renewables is a more attractive option now than having to stay in, 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 in the fossils. And, and, and the trends and developments in the market out there are so exciting. And we have to ensure that we then provide the right framework for investments, for industry, for uh, pension funds, for, for the capital markets, et cetera, et cetera, because then, then we really will have momentum. But we need to ensure that we have the framework right. That, that requires, again, that we remove some of the barriers Myself, I'm I'm very much concerned or occupied with this issue of of interconnections and cross-border exchange of energy flows. I think we do not emphasize at this point enough that if we are to succeed with our ambitions, we have to ensure that energy can flow more freely cross borders than we have been used to. We do not have a single market of energy. This is what we should aim for. And I think this this study also uh, makes that point uh, very clear. And then finally. Uh, the issue of permitting, uh, our, our big headache for the next 10, uh, uh, 20, 30 years or so. Uh, and, and I don't think there are any easy solutions to this, but it is baffling and striking seeing the developments all over Europe, how difficult this is if we are to invest and deploy more renewables. I mean, we have to use land, we have to use space, we have to use the seas and how to do this in a proper manner, ensuring that we maintain speed seems to be the biggest headache, in, in my opinion. And, and I think this study also illustrates how important this is, given that we need speed in order to deploy. Thanks. Yeah, absolutely, Morton. Completely agree on the permitting issue. We're going to come back. In fact, I'm going to address the, the question to, to Lucas in a second on that, put him on the spot. Um, but also agree with the, the, the importance of successes, so concrete successes. I mean, targets, of course, are important, but concrete successes, such as the growth of renewables, um, is, is such a sign of the way we need to move. 
So now on to Villa. So from an industry perspective, you know, you're on the business end of this. What's your take on the situation? Yeah, thanks a lot for really, really interesting presentation. Uh, I, I think my biggest take of, of this power parameter was that uh, when looking at the graph or how quickly we need to decarbonize, we need to change the trend really radically. And that means, of course, that we need to have radical tools to, to reach that change in, in the uh, emissions. And uh, that we learned actually through Vartila Energy Transition Lab uh, during the COVID that it's possible and the power systems will work with uh, lower carbon and a bigger share of renewables. We learned that some countries were able to uh, reduce emissions up to 30% uh, during the COVID year. And I, I think th this is important learning. So basically power systems are ready to, to be changed. And if looking then forward, I, I think we need to still start from the power sector. The, the emission reductions are easiest and cheapest. And if looking this, how we can transit uh, the power sector uh, kind of affordable way, I would say that the first step is that build as much as renewables as possible. Uh, I think that's no brainer. But then the second as important step is that we need to ensure that uh, the, the systems are stable. We need flexibility both for short and long term. On the short term, the batteries are obvious choice, but we need to have some technologies for the longer term flexibility. And there the flexible gas is playing the important role during the transition, but we start to shift that also to, to hydrogen-based technologies like engines or, or fuel cells. But maybe the last one, we, which is quite often forget, is that we just need to phase out the existing base load, especially the coal. It does not make any sense to transit from the gas to hydrogen if there is still 75% of uh, generation in Poland coming from coal. Similarly, 30% of generation is coming in Germany uh, from coal. So we need to start in the right order this transition. Thanks, Rilla. Okay, Christian, you've heard from the institutions, so from the Commission, the Parliament, you've also heard from industry. What's your take on what you've just heard? Well, I think it, uh, the discussion here sums up very well the, the challenges we're facing. We, we are at a really, really critical and unprecedented inflection point, which is now we need to go to light speed pretty much. And, and, and how do you do that? This is not something we usually do in the power sector. This is not something we usually do in the EU. So how to significantly accelerate the pace without losing all those things we've built over many years. For instance, a very well functioning or increasingly well functioning internal market uh, and, and how to ensure that the investment frameworks are, are guarded and, and, and made attractive for investors. Right now, we're seeing some very worrying signs of fragmentation that um, can uh, pose a new risk to, to, to the pace that we need. And that's about uh, interventions in the market coming from governments trying to address the issue of, of rising power prices. Yeah, thanks, Christian. And that's a perfect segue into what we want to discuss next, which is the, the recent increase in, in electricity prices. Um, sparking political debate across uh, across Europe, both at uh, member state level, but also now the, in, in the institutions. So the increase in electricity prices is due to many causes, uh, almost like a perfect storm of uh, economic recovery post COVID. Um, we, we have um, a chilly spring and also low renewables uh, in, in the summer. Um, if you combine that with um, with the reliance on imported gas, you get what is a temporary increase in electricity prices. So this can clearly have an effect on vulnerable customers and, and potentially slow down electrification. So again, coming to you first, Lucas, what's your take on this, uh, this recent development and what are the potential solutions? What is the commission looking at to solve this? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, the fact is that yesterday I came back from Ljubljana from the informal discussion of the energy ministers and uh, the increase of energy prices uh, was indeed one of the topics that, uh, that they discussed there. And we are of course aware of the situations um, uh, in different member states and we are uh, closely monitoring the situation. As you said, the high prices are the result of a combination of effects 
uh, of the increase in the gas uh, prices and demand due to economic recovery, unusual undersupply, and to a lesser extent, the increase in the ETS prices. And this is combined with high seasonal demand and you also mentioned unfavorable weather conditions. What we need to focus now, I think there is no doubt about it, is the vulnerable consumer, those who cannot afford to pay the increased bills. There are tools that the member states can use to address the situation immediately. Think about tax policy, VAT, excise. Think about targeted social measures. Um, the ETS revenue recycling, higher ETS price means more revenues uh, for the member states. Temporary measures for households or small businesses or direct support to consumers. All, this, all these steps can be taken in line with the EU rules. And the Commission will draw up very soon a toolbox, which we think could help the member states to navigate these options while staying within the EU policy framework and keeping our objectives inside. But also, I'd like to say that in the longer run, the solution here is again deployment of renewables, accelerated deployment of renewables and improved energy efficiency. We must keep investing in wind and solar to have more days when renewables are setting the price. Today's situation underlies, underlines that we have to limit our dependence on foreign fossil fuels as soon as possible. And on energy efficiency, it's a solution to energy poverty, to growing energy bills. Using less energy means paying for less energy. And now is a good time to take advantage of the European funds, of domestic funds, and prioritize renovation and other measures. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks a lot, Lucas. And, and maybe that's uh, over to you now, Morton. And a specific question about that, the import, the reliance on imported gas. I mean, you know, I think 60% of the of the gas imports uh, from outside Europe. So to you, I mean, what what is your take on the current price rises and the solutions, especially on the, the gas issue? So I can uh, more or less, uh, you know, adhere, subscribe or, or agree with what Lucas was uh, was was saying, but but I just have to 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 say that in in political terms, this is absolutely toxic. What's what's going on now? I mean, we have some long term measures, initiatives, visions, fit for fifty five. We have a very elaborate package of legislation on the table right now uh, that will pave the way for the next 10, 20, 30 years or so, and then on the very near term, short term. We have this extremely toxic development where member states and politicians all over Europe are with very good reason, totally frightened by the prospect of seeing their electorates, their constituents uh, freezing uh, this uh, upcoming uh, winter when going to bed. So this is absolutely toxic uh, and it will provide ammunition to the skeptics wanting to preserve status quo, saying that, oh, no, 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 we shouldn't move too fast into renewables because they are intermittent and what have you. So I'm really worried with this development, how this will play out in political terms. And we have to bear in mind and be very focused on that, despite the short-term fluctuations, which can be addressed through some of the means that Lucas just mentioned, that we have to maintain focus on the, on the longer term. And that implies saving energy i mean energy efficiency is key to this and then coming back to the very basic point that we have to ensure we roll out renewables faster than we've done uh, so far in order simply to secure also a security of supply so it is a wide range of measures and i'm i'm deeply worried about by the short term impacts of this uh, of of this of these developments uh, lately so i think coming out with the toolbox demonstrating to member states and politicians that there are tools out there that can be used in order to address these very short term fluctuations is absolutely critical and then stay focused on the long term yeah, absolutely. Well, we, I mean, we fully subscribe to that long-term solutions to solve what is a temporary short-term issue. Completely agree. Uh, Villa, what's your take on it? Yeah, but I was about to mention that uh, I hope that uh, this is temporary situation, uh, of course, driven by high gas prices. And I think the solution for this current issue is actually energy transition. 
because when we build more renewable renewables, there is less link uh, for these fuel prices. Of course, assuming that uh, the hydrogen economy is also built more on on top of renewables, counting on on the green green hydrogen, and that that's the way to get kind of uh, the link away from from the gas prices. But I think also when we move in in this transition, may we may face another. Uh, affordability challenge that how we kind of use the money wisely uh, how we can ensure that each and every euro brings the ma maximum decarbonization and Vartsila has quite long history on, on the power system modeling and uh, I decided to, to share one example from Germany of, of kind of future modeling we, we look at that what you could do uh, if you have 50 billion more to speed up the transition and basically with that money you can afford to to ban the new uh, gas uh, in, in the power sector but you drop only emissions by 1.5 percent alternatively if you spend this 50 billion to speed up the coal phase out and reach the net zero in germany in 2040 instead of 2045 you can drop emissions with 19 percent. So basically deciding the political path with the same money, you can reduce emissions either with 1.5 percent or 90. And I think that's super important that we rely on the kind of scientific facts and, and sophisticated modeling when we are doing the decisions, mm -hmm. how we can reduce the emissions most effectively. Okay, thanks Villa. And finally, Christian, your take on the, the price rises. Yeah, thanks. I think the, the key word here is that we are talking about a temporary situation. Now, temporary in politics uh, is something a little bit different from, from temporary in other contexts. It's very clear that governments need to do something if they are facing uh, a very big uh, a backlash from their populations. What's absolutely critical when we're dealing with something that's temporary is that we don't resort to political panic. And, um, and I think we are seeing right now examples of uh, governments doing the right thing and governments doing the exact wrong thing. Um, so some governments are going in and uh, reducing the taxes on electricity that helps uh, immediately on the electricity bill. And it also incentivizes electrification. Other governments are intervening in the market, um, putting in place new taxes on individual companies fragmenting the market, distorting things, and undermining the investment environment. So with short-term measures undermining the long-term, that's exactly what we don't need. And, and Spain is a good example of those very, very poor policies right now, unfortunately. Now, what can we do and what should we do? I think the taxes are, are the obvious example of, of what can be done immediately. And, and I think this idea of putting on the table some very clear guidance, what is actually within the remit of the EU legislation to do is, uh, is going to be helpful. And the last thing I think is, is necessary to say here is that as we move into a future with more and more renewable electricity, we can foresee a continuation of volatility. And that requires us to think about the market design going forward. We need to make sure that we have a system that, that is properly designed for a net zero electricity system. The one we have currently in place is a system that is designed more for a transition and, and, and something that, that carries a lot of legacy from a former system. We need to start thinking carefully about a system that provides for consistent low prices for electricity so that we can do the transition uh, in our sector and also electrify while keeping citizens happy about the uh, energy prices. Thanks a lot, Christian. And we're going to wrap up now with just two specific questions. One first to, to Lucas and then to, to Vili, and we'll give you the, the last word, Christian. So Lucas, come back and put you on the spot. I mean, Morton mentioned a couple of times the permitting elephant in the room, if you like. You know, in the new targets, 40% uh, renewables by 2030 translate into approximately 500 gigawatts of new build wind and solar. Um, what's the commission's uh, you know, approach to the permitting? And is there any way you know, that you can incentivize and encourage the member states to take action as well? Yeah, I mean, obviously it's a crucial topic. 
not an easy topic and a topic without, uh, without one size fits all solution. We clearly observe many administrative obstacles for the deployment of renewables when it comes to permitting procedures. Think about non-transparent processes, lack of legal coherence, insufficient regulatory framework or guidance, insufficient spatial planning, or a lack of experienced staff in permitting authorities. But I want to say that uh, there is EU legislation that is already addressing this problem, the Renewables Directive in force, which was supposed to be fully transposed by the member states by end of June, addresses the issue to some extent. For example, it introduced provisions on the organization and maximum duration of the permit granting processes. It covers all relevant permits to build, repower and operate plants for the production of energy from renewable sources and for the grid connection. That's also important. Also, member states need to establish a single contact point to guide applicants through the entire administrative processes. And obviously, we will monitor very closely how all this has been transposed into national laws. The member states also need to report measures that they take to ease permitting every two years. And we will be assessing that, evaluating it. Uh, challenges across the EU on public acceptance are similar. Uh, and therefore, to help the promoters of energy infrastructure projects of common interests, we have issued an engagement book this year, but we would like to do more, that's clear. Next year, we will issue guidance for member states on streamlining permitting and administrative procedures for renewable energy development. And that will include best practices to be used across the member states where possible. Uh, and based on how the situation evolves, the Commission may propose modification to the rules on permitting and administrative procedures in the Renewables Directive that we also are announcing now in the revision. Thank you. Thanks, Lucas. And uh, we at Euroelectric will definitely support you in that. And we will also want to do a lot more on that topic. Uh, Villa. Over to you. And the question about, well, interestingly, there's also negative electricity prices. Uh, we see more and more in the market. And, it, you know, that could be a signal to business as a, you know, a business model for flexibility solutions. Uh, what's your view on that? And, and what would incentivize business more to introduce flexibility solutions? And please keep your answer short, just uh, in the interest of time. Yes, uh, for, for sure. Uh, Basically, firstly, we, we need to separate the, the average prices and volatility. The average is which matters for, for the industries and uh, consumers. And the volatility is really the investment signal, uh, what Christian mentioned already. Uh, so the volatility is needed to get uh, those uh, flexibility investments to, to balance the renewables. And luckily, we are now seeing a little bit more uh, volatility in European markets, but at the same time, we are still re really far from the volatility what we are seeing in the US or Australia. And there, the utilities has learned how to manage that. And uh, what comes to, to our business, uh, we have seen a quite nice uh, increase on, on demands on the energy storage, especially in, in the UK market uh, during the, the COVID period. And uh, some balancing power plants uh, we are building now in, in Italy. But uh, what we see also, that there is still some delays on, on those flexible gas uh, projects uh, because there is some uncertainty still around uh, the role of the gas in, in this uh, energy transition. Okay, thanks a lot. So we're going to go to you, Christian, to wrap up. And what's your takeaway, your main takeaway from this year's power barometer? Uh, my main takeaway, uh, Bruce, is that we're really in a hurry um, and, um, and we need to, to join forces, all good forces, to make this happen now. Um, perhaps I'd like to just um, introduce one comment to the permitting question, because uh, I think Luke has laid out a lot of good things that the Commission is doing, but this is, for me, perhaps the most important example of where we need to do more and think new in order to stay on track uh, I'm, I'm genuinely worried about that. I see us lagging behind everywhere I look in all member states. And, and I think we need to think new. 
I want to introduce just a, a very interesting fact I learned yesterday. If you were to build all the solar uh, that you need for the uh, transition in Italy, you would require 0.6% uh, of the agricultural um, area in Spain, uh, sorry, in, in Italy. Now, that, of course, raises the question, would there be a possibility of thinking new here? Um, the so-called agrivoltaics, the combination of agriculture and, and solar panels is proving to be very efficient, both in terms of, of uh, producing better crops and, and, and protecting crops uh, in, in times of extreme weather. And at the same time, we have the chance to build out. Now, we also have a huge pot of money for agriculture in the EU. And, and the question is, is there a possibility to think new and across boundaries here to, to basically make the space available for that build out? Because if we think conventionally, think as we have been thinking until now, we're not going to make it. So, uh, so let's, let's brainstorm on this and find a way forward. Thanks, Christian. That's all we have time for today. You can watch this panel and the other presentations again on this web page. Please feel free to post on social media about the findings using the hashtags PowerBarometer21, It's Electric and Electric Decade. Join us for other events over the coming months covering renewables, tariffs, flexibility, e-mobility, digitalization and many more topics. Thanks again to our expert speakers and see you all again soon. Goodbye.